I'm delighted to welcome Marcus Roma as our next guest. Uh, Marcus is a director and theatre maker, but before we talk to Marcus, let's see some examples of his work. This is me, Paul Vardaman. I'm about to die. Wow, that's a, a huge selection of things. Marcus, tell us about some of the images you've just seen, please. Well, those are a lot of from uh, the theatre shows I've made over the years. For many years, I was artistic director of a company called Pilot Theatre, and that was a national touring company. And we co-produced with many, many organisations. So a lot of those shows were from things that were from writers like Roy Williams. So we did Sing Your Heart Out for the Lads, did The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner and Antigone. Also Romeo and, che Romeo and Juliet's... Um, Romeo and Juliet from Shakespeare, and a variety of other of things that we did, which toured for about eight or nine months every year into large-scale venues. And that was a body of work that I made. And also there's a film there called The Knife That Killed Me, which I made for Universal Pictures. And all of those involved technology and involved large casts, and uh, we presented work for young people and young audiences for whom it might have been their very first experience of seeing something in a cinema or a theatre. So that's the kind of work that I've been making throughout my career. That's fantastic. Um, so um, I, I introduced you as director and theatre maker. Um, what does that actually mean on a day to day basis? Talk us through what, what you actually what sort of what's an average is there an average day? And if so, what do you do, Marcus? OK, well, just to just to tell everybody, there's never an average day of anything. And every single day is spent at the moment. Obviously, we are you know, not working. I have been working as a theatre director, but obviously the theatres are closed at the moment. But I have been still working as a director. Uh, and that means I've been working from home and we've made a series of six videos which have taken stories from the pandemic, from pe things that people have written and we've had those voiced with actors and then created with designers and artists, so a series of videos. We've also just made a brand new project on a software platform called Roblox and some of your um, viewers might be familiar with that. It's a gaming platform and what we've done is we've built an entire series of worlds and we've done live performance within that. So we've had actors coming in, we've had designers, but we've also mixed it by using live audio. So it's possible to go in there, and we did a live performance last week, where we were able to tell stories, share some new ideas, and we had a new piece written by Roy Williams about Black Lives Matter that was, that was premiered on Friday night in Roblox by using three actors. So we were able to respond to situations and make work that's vital, that's done now. So every day involves creative thinking and thinking what can we do to tell stories? Because ultimately, in the world that I work in, it's involving telling stories. And we want to tell stories to audiences and to communicate those stories to those audiences. And so we always try and find the best ways of being able to do that. And so if theatres aren't open, then what other mechanisms can we use? So there's a lot of stuff we've done online. And very recently, I've made a piece of Zoom theatre using the Zoom platform like we're doing today. And that was across with um, students all over Norway. And uh, they had been sent home from their, from their college. And they were all scattered all over the country. And we put together a piece of War of the Worlds, again, recorded on Zoom, recorded in HD, recorded with audio, with backgrounds around them, and enable those students to build what would have been their final piece and final term show, but we put it together online. So really what I think we're talking about here is that every single day you need to think creatively about how you can connect and communicate with audiences on the stories that you want to tell. And that's brilliant, that's brilliant. Wow. 
Okay, I need to take you back a little bit now because um, I'm interested in, in if there was any person or one thing or event that actually inspired you to pursue a career in, in, in the creative industries, film and theatre. There's been many people who've influenced me over time. Um, some of those were teachers back in school um, and some of those were people as, when I went to college. I went to college and studied science, and, but I always knew I wanted to be an actor or do something because that's all I knew about creative industries. Um, they didn't really exist in that term then. And certainly around the technology and the ability to be able to make and tell and share stories. Um, there was a particular director who was um, a student at the time and he now runs an organisation. He is the director of a large venue in Manchester called Home and his name is Dave Moutry. We were both students at the time at university and he said, you're okay, you should give this a bit of a go. And I took that as an encouragement and actually he was really, you know, he was really supportive. Um, I didn't get a lot of family support when I was growing up and going through school and stuff because they, everyone thought it was the wrong thing to do and you shouldn't do it. So I know that's a thing that is, is sometimes quite common that I hear a lot. And I didn't get a lot of support from my family around that and they actively discouraged me at some times. But effectively, you kept finding the places of people who were supportive and you could ask for their help and ask them questions. And also, I learned to get things wrong. Um, I learned to make mistakes and it's through making the mistakes that even if you fall flat on your face and you make a fool of yourself when you get up you're slightly further forward than when you fell over and I've always taken that as advice because to make mistakes is to learn and that's how I've learned uh, becoming a director and a writer and a filmmaker because I've learned through things that ah, that's how you do it better next time and that's what we do and so did you did you train to be an actor is that your original plan no i trained to be a dental surgeon <laughs> which is of course the completely not the right route to go towards becoming working in the creative industries um, i did dentistry and then i ended up working as a dentist okay so everyone can kind of go who is this guy now but i'll tell you what it did teach me taught me that I've made absolutely the wrong decision and choice, but therefore I was then going to make a decision and a choice to move away from that. So I learned from that fact that I realized that I like talking and I like communicating with people and I'd pick possibly the worst job that that could happen in. Nobody wants to talk, no one can talk to you and you end up feeling really isolated. So I'd made the worst, the worst opposite point of where I wanted to be. So I realized that every single step was going to be up from that. Uh, what it did teach me, it taught me to make decisions. Um, working in the industry I used to do, you have to make hundreds of decisions every single day around dealing with situations. Well, if that doesn't work, I'm going to have to do that. And if that doesn't work, I need to do that. And if that fails, I need to do that. And you have to make those decisions, which you have to do when you're working in the creative industries, because you're making decisions on whether something is going to work or not or you're going to try it out and if it doesn't work you have to know what else you're going to do if it suddenly starts raining or if the light goes or if someone doesn't turn up you've really got to make those decisions so what it did was it equipped me in a, in a way i wasn't expecting um, but it certainly was not the traditional route that is really, that's an amazing answer um, we talk at the moment about um the power of creative industries and creativity and that young people need to be able to be self-confident to express themselves think outside the box and we always include learn from mistakes as you just said so those seem to be really common threads there um no one has the perfect career though yours sounds really fascinating um what would you say is the best bit about what you do and because nothing's perfect what maybe are some of the challenges of your your roles the best thing that that I have and it's such a, an immense um, you know an immense luxury to do is that you can you can choose the people you are going to work with and you can develop artists around you and you can bring people forward and you can absolutely have the ability to be able to build those teams and support people who might have less experience by putting experienced people around them and you see those teams those diverse teams grow and flourish and it's a great privilege i suppose it's a little bit like teaching where you see someone that comes in and they you know they have potential and you see them over time develop and grow with the right support and the right projects and enable them to fly and I've seen that through my career many, many times with people who've come through and they've, they've done some acting, and, but then they have 
they were really, really good assistant directors. And then they, you let people direct. And that's one thing I did learn through my training is that when you're working in the, in the health service and you're doing operations, you observe the first one, you assist on the second one, and the third one you do yourself under supervision. Observe, assist, do. You don't need to assist forever and ever and ever. You need to do, and it's learning by doing that's the key thing. And that's what I would like to, to stress today for many young people who are watching, is that you can, learning by doing something is that you will actually learn how to do it better next time. You know, you need to actually practically get on there and, and put it out there in the world and make something. So making and doing, but never making do, is really one of the things I'd like to say. Brilliant. And, and the bits that are more challenging or less exciting, it all sounds exciting, but what are the bits that are more challenging about your career, would you say? Well, all of the things like um, chasing funding and tenders and paperwork and administration and all of the kind of the other, the other office-y bits, if you like, um, those are the bits which you have to do because it enables you to make the things that you're wanting to make. But obviously there's a lot of sort of paperwork and, and legwork and, and, and sometimes you, you go for things and you don't get them. And you absolutely have to understand and you have to learn that and you learn that very, very early on that you will, you will go for things and you won't get them and you might, and you, but you can't give up because you know you might you know I've been for many things and I worked as an actor for many years and you go for things which you desperately want and you don't get it now if you were falling if you fall at the first hurdle and give up then you, that's sort of game over if you like it's at the end of the platform and actually the my, my 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 top advice is that you will still even my career now I still go for things and don't get them and actually what you have to realize is that well I will then make something in a different way or I will I will then take that learning and move it forward so you have to really develop that sense of of belief that you actually can do this and with the right support and the teams around you you are able to do it but you will get knockbacks and people will say no and doors will shut but you just have to learn to bang harder on the doors or go around the other side and go through the window um, and and find people who can help you to do that that's really good advice so so the transition you made well you've made many transitions clearly but i think people would be surprised the fact that, that a theatre pr practitioner, a theatre professional, seemingly moved see easily or moved across into film. Is that was that a difficult transition? Was that were they similar skills? How did that happen? Well, it was. Um, I've always ad adapted and worked with um, with texts, particularly for young audiences. So we've done many projects. I did about 960 performances of Lord of the Flies with five different teams over ten years, and then we did. Um, adaptations of novels like Rumblefish and Looking for JJ and various things which are young adult fiction and I came across a book called The Knife That Killed Me and it was set in Yorkshire where, where the company I was working with was based and I went to meet the author um, called Anthony McGowan and he's just won the Carnegie Medal for best piece of work and best novel for young people this week and it's a a book called Lark. So he's still going strong and writing amazing things. And so I got hold of the book and asked if I could adapt it because it spoke to audiences and it spoke to young people. And it was, and this was back in 2008 when we got the rights. And it was wanting to tell a story which is a little bit like a more contemporary version of the, of the film and the book Kez, which some of you may have heard of or, or in fact seen. And in fact, it was around an outsider at a school in Yorkshire um, who was struggling and made some wrong choices in life and got in and you know and then was was having to live with those consequences and what we wanted to do was tell that story and it would have been a great piece of theatre but we decided to make it into a film because we shot it all in a green screen so it was all in a green screen studio a little bit like a rehearsal room so the actors many of whom it was their first job um, the girl playing Rosie, she was 14. Um, we, you know, we picked people, we did school casting, and she's, fant you know, she's fantastic, and she's 21, and she's graduated now and, and working all over the world. But these, these we, we worked with many, many young people, because it was set in a school, but it's all done in a green screen studio. And so we were able to work like we're doing in a rehearsal room. Um, but we had tape on the floor and go, well, you imagine you go through that line there, then that's in the bedroom, or that's into the kitchen. Okay, like theater. So it's very transferable skills. 
and we were able to just work with the actors and just work with it in that space, shoot them against green screen, and then in post-production, put all the kind of backgrounds and images in. Again, and those were made by young people. Wow. And Universal Pictures liked the project and then released it, and it was shown all over the world, and it did lots of things, and it went to festivals, and then you can download it from iTunes and Amazon and all that stuff. And so it's, it's wow. one of the things that was an interesting project. It was really fascinating, and it was, I learned a lot. Well, it's brilliant about what you said. Two things strike me. First of all, that it is possible to use young talent, young people to do amazing things. And I think that's heartening for all those who are watching it. And the other thing which struck me um, is when you're young, time seems to be limited. But am I right? You said in 2008 you got the rights for the book. And the film was produced in... When, when was the film released? Which year? Okay, we shot it in 20... There were nine drafts of the scripts I went through until I got the green light from Universal. So there were nine drafts of the script. Uh, we finally got the final sign off at the end of 2011 and we shot it in 2012. It was in, it was in post-production for two years because the visual effects and the coloring in, there's just, this, is, this is for people who are doing pub quizzes. In a 90 minute film, there are 138,000 frames because it's 25 frames a second. So you can wow. 138,000 frames. And every single one of those was hand finished because there, were artwork, there was artwork on every single frame. Wow. And if you look at the film, you can see because things are written in there and things are added on. Um, and so it took two years to finish that. It was finally released in 2015. Wow. So in fact, 2008 to 2015 seems like a, a lifetime to a young person, but clearly the amount of time and effort that went into that, and it was worth it because the rewards were, were, were great. Well, it's like anything, by the end of it, by seven years, we were, we were all getting really sick of it because we wanted it out because I'm, I'm quite impatient and I like to make a piece of theatre. As I said, we did a piece last week which had a brand new premiere of a piece that only arrived in the inbox on the Tuesday and we premiered it on the Friday. A piece by Roy Williams, fantastic writer. If you don't know him, look him up. He's an amazing writer. And he'd written a special piece for us uh, around, around Black Lives Matter and Windrush. And I had two actors, Suzanne McLean, Oliver Alvin Wilson, who got the script. We rehearsed it on the Thursday, premiered it on the Friday. Wow. The immediacy of those things is very potent and really strong. And the world we live in now means that we can do that. And I would urge many people who are watching this, you have the power in your hands to be able to create and make using the tools that you've got with your phones. You've got great recording facilities. You can do this. I mean, you've got TikTok. You've got all those platforms that you are able to be able to generate new work on and tell stories. And ultimately, it's about you creating and making and you can do this because you have the tools at your disposal. You just need to just a little bit of time and thought about what stories you want to tell. And you think an audience might want to hear that and then find the best way of getting it out there and just do it. Mark, that's fantastic. It's been so good talking to you. Hopefully you're going to join us for the panel discussion. But actually, huge thank you. Um, it's been wonderful. Marcus, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for asking me. It's really nice to be here.